Somebody go out and get some coffee. <laughs> this crowd needs it. <laughs> it's good to be with you and to study God's word with you today. We have a special event that's kind of uh, not totally revealed to everybody that's involved. Uh, you know, it's kind of like when you want to have a surprise birthday party for somebody or something. And uh, Doug and Donna are going to be remembered today, uh, I think, by uh, all of us as they think about the uh, and I'm go there with us today that they're going to be going down to Phoenix to live and uh, leave us here in the cold and the ice and uh, the difficulties of the mountains. But uh, we will miss them a great deal. Uh, Dave and Masha are going to assume a lot of the responsibilities they've had and uh, to release also with the uh, uh, Eagle Academy where we uh, heard an announcement about that last week. We're very, very, very grateful for everybody that's stepping up to the plate and doing what needs to be done, making sure that no bases are left uh, uncovered. As we listen to that reading this morning, you see that the Apostle Paul is writing about some of the people that he knew real well. Epaphroditus, and then he mentions Timothy in Philippians chapter 2. In the early part of that chapter, he says that we need to value others above ourselves. What does that mean? Well, we know what it is to value something that is precious. If you lose something that uh, costs you a fortune, or if you lose something that your grandmother gave to you, or something of that nature, uh, you really get all shook up about it because it's something of value to you. It may have a monetary value, it may not, but it has value of some nature to you. And uh, it says here, value your brethren, the other members of the church, Christians that you meet along the way, with whom you work, value them above yourself. And uh, things that are valuable, we take good care of. Things that are valuable, we don't want to lose. Things that are valuable, we try to let others know that we're blessed to have them. And uh, yet, uh, we don't always do that with one another. As I look out, at, uh, we have a small crowd today, but as I look at you and remember all the others that are not able to be with us today, and uh, the many times we've gotten together, the occasions when we have prayed together in your home, eaten together uh, in your home, I, I remember just how precious you are to me. You mean a lot to me. And... Uh, Kelly uh, is down in Houston right now helping her mother, but uh, I don't know how many times uh, she's called and made me remember things that I need to cover, bases I need to attend to, and uh, she knows how valuable you are, how precious you are, and uh, so we're, su we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to remember our brethren with a heart that is very sensitive to them and concerned about their health concerned about their wealth, concerned about everything that uh, they do, their children, their parents, and uh, any way we can, we try to be there for them and to help them. And that's what it means to value somebody. And uh, when you look at the rest of that chapter, Philippians chapter 2, though, you see what Paul understood that to mean for him, the Paphroditus that we just read about. And I uh, appreciate Xander doing that for us. And um, it was a person that was very special to Paul. Why? Well, he is the one, when Paul was in prison in Rome, that was willing to take money, funds, that were given by the church in the city of Philippi, and he was willing to get out on the road and carry that and take it all the way to Rome to give it to the Apostle Paul. That not only was a lot of work and a great distance to travel, but it also was a dangerous trip. Uh, in those days, you didn't, you didn't have the protection that we have on our highways here. Uh, and so he ran the risk by going out on the highways of Rome and all the streets of, of uh, Rome are the ones that come in from everywhere in the world. That was just like the center of the world. And uh, you're out there on the busiest highways 
and with some of the most uh, unhealthy situations. And yet he was willing to do that to take some money to Paul because Paul's in prison. He can't come to us. We can't give him any help. So let's send it. Well, who will go? Well, the Paphrodite said, I'll go. And we don't know what happened to him, but he did get sick. And that's mentioned in that context that we just read. And uh, Paul said he almost died. And he said, but God spared him and spared me because he knew that he would suffer greatly if Aphrodite, bringing him this help, had passed away. Well, what is he going to do? He's going to write back to the church in Philippi and tell them, you know, how he feels about everything that happened and how he appreciates the help he's received. And uh, who's going to carry the letter back to the church in Philippi? Well, it's going to be Aphrodite. And so as soon as Epaphroditus is well enough to carry this letter that we can read today, and this letter that we're enjoying is something that he provided for us way back when, but he was sent to the Apostle Paul because he had a great love for Paul. He valued Paul enough to take the money to him. He valued Paul and the Christians in Philippi enough to bring back that correspondence. And he values us today by giving us this correspondence that we can read and appreciate, share. And when it says that we should value one another, there's a real life example of what that means. And I'm sure that each one of us could relate many, many occasions when somebody showed that they valued us by being there for us when we were sick or being there for us when we needed to be taken someplace and didn't have a car or whatever. Uh, we care for each other. We're supposed to. I mean, you know, that's how we're supposed to be identified according to John 13, uh, 34 and 35 is that they'll know you by your love. We sing about it. We read about it. The Bible's full of it. And so as we think about our valuing other people and doing things for them because we do consider them precious. Uh, that's how the world is supposed to recognize that we're Christian people because supposedly for the most part out in the world, that's not how people live. That's not how they feel. That's not how they act. That's not how they treat each other. And so we're supposed to be different in that respect. And we're supposed to attribute value to each other. And uh, there's nothing worse than to see somebody that values himself above anybody else around him. Uh, boasts all the time, tries to get the biggest piece of pie when it's cut, tries always to have people take care of him, even if he doesn't take care of anybody. And uh, so we, we don't appreciate people who are like that. It's difficult to really value people who don't value others. And so we, we find that there's a definition of what was meant in uh, Philippians chapter two, verse three, when you see the relationship between Paul and Aphrodite. But then immediately he goes on and talks about Timothy. Uh, why? Well, he's talking about valuing each other. And then he gives a wonderful example of Aphrodite. So I guess it's time to talk about Timothy a little bit. And that's because Timothy was helping him right there on the ground in Philippi. And he was the one that traveled with Paul a lot and was always willing to take care of Paul. He was, in several occasions, like Paul's secretary, did the writing for him. We know that the Apostle Paul had problems with his eyesight and uh, you have this young man that's willing to go with him, help him. And he, he's the one that Paul talks about and says he's known the scripture since he was just a child because his grandmother and his mother were holy people. Father was a Greek and he wasn't a believer like the mom and the grandma were, but uh, he had good training and he had a good heart, good knowledge of the scriptures. He says, you've known the scripture since you were just a child. So he was a tool for Paul in his ministry. Wherever he went, he could count on Timothy to be there with him if he needed him and help him. And uh, so I would say that as he is mentioning Timothy, he's preserving the memory of Timothy for us. Uh, we talk about Timothy just like we, you know, we met him somewhere once before on a trip. Why? Because Paul has introduced him to us and given us a really good 
uh, image of what that man was like and what Paul could count on him to do for him. And so we need to value one another like Epaphroditus did Paul in the church in Philippi, like Timothy did for Paul and the other people that he worked with because they had others like Titus that traveled with them. Uh, you, get the, you get the image, but that's how God has always been and always wanted to be and is, and uh, we can count on him because he loves us, and that's how we know 1 John 4, 8, that he is a wonderful God because of the love that he has for us in spite of the fact that we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God is willing to forgive. God's willing to help us. God's willing to nurture us. And uh, so his children do the same among themselves. And that's how people that are not a part of our fellowship look at us and identify us and say, oh, you're a child of God. Oh, you belong to that fellowship. Oh, that's your family. These people belong to you and you belong to them. And, you know, it, you know, and I know, that if we have a congregation, large or small, and we don't take care of each other, don't care about each other, don't promote each other, but we're selfish and we want everything for ourselves and we're looking to see what we can get out of this uh, involvement with this group of people. If, we, if we're like that, then uh, we're not going to see the church prosper ever, never, ever. One of the things that draws people in and I've noticed this, and you have too, I bet. You've been in a church very long. People come and visit, and when they do, the first thing that they'll say when they leave, if somebody asks them, well, what did you think of that church? What are they going to say? Well, they had a lot of what? Love for each other. Or if they didn't like that congregation, often the remark is, well, I just didn't feel loved or that there was love among the, the members there, and uh, that's a qualifier or a disqualifier every single time. But it's difficult to go into a midst of people that really love each other, that care about each other, that are concerned about one another, that value one another, like Paul did at Epaphroditus and like Paul did Timothy. If you see that kind of love, it's very difficult not to be attracted by it. It's something that uh, you want to be a part of. I wouldn't want to deliberately go out and look for a church where there's not much love among the members and say, now that's where I want to be. That's where I want to learn about God because you know you're not going to get it. And that's not what, you know, we want. But why is uh, the church so involved in that idea of loving each other, caring for each other, providing for each other, valuing each other, because God set the example for us. How can God value you? If, if I were to ask God, God, in my prayers, God, could you tell me please why Masha is a good person or why you like her? She's sitting right here. That's why I'm picking on her. Maybe we should be sitting in the back. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> as, you, as you think about God's attitude, you see that he knew how to value people. He knew how to, in spite of their sins, appreciate them. And that's what you see when uh, you see the world just going to hell in a basket, as they say, over in Genesis chapter 6 in the days of Noah. And uh, it, their thoughts were just constant. Even the imaginations that were going to lead to their deep thoughts were always evil. I mean, they were bad. They were very violent people. Genesis 6, verse 8 and 9 tells us, however, that in the midst of them, there was a guy that God valued. Who was that? You can speak up. Noah. Noah. Yeah. And it said because he was, he was a good man. He was upright and blameless. And he walked with God. And as a consequence, God really appreciated him. And he should be grateful for the fact that God did, because otherwise he would have been taking some really extensive swimming lessons that would not have turned out well. And uh, so the world was destroyed. Can God be angry? Yes. 
Was he angry at everybody? No. Uh, do you think Noah ever sinned? Yes. But in spite of that, God loved him because he was a man trying to do what God wanted him to do, be the kind of person he ought to be. And God saved him, his wife, three sons, and their wives. And they were the only people that survived that flood. It was because God realized, I can't let this man die. And when you think about, you know, a hundred years to build a boat, that's a long time. But that's apparently the amount of time that Noah and his family spent building the ark. And then they got on board and their lives were spared. And the world still has human beings in it because of them. And it was because God realized there was some value here. There's some qualities that are worth preserving. And I, I personally am very grateful for that because as I think about the sins I've committed in my life and the problems I've generated instead of resolved in the lives of others, I think, oh, I'm so glad that God is capable of loving somebody who has sinned and forgive that person if they repent because I'm one of the benefactors of that. God has blessed me, forgiven me, accepted me, valued me. And I tell you, when I pray, I promise you this is true. When I pray, I worry about that a little bit. Uh, we're supposed to have faith in God, and I think I do, but not just the existence of God, but the nature of God. And sometimes when I bow my head and Think about my personality. Think about things I've said, done. Imagine things that occurred and I could have fixed, I didn't, and all the things I should be ashamed of. Boy, when that happens, I, I have to ask myself, am I really going to be forgiven? Does God really love me that much? And there's that tie again between loving, forgiving, and valuing somebody. Uh, if God couldn't forgive us, could he value us very much? Say, so, no, this one goes to the trash heap too. And he does have his trash heap. It's called hell. Uh, but if we turn humbly before him and ask him to please, please, I hope you can find something good in me that you can appreciate, something that you're happy about, God. And God says, I do. And then I think about the situation where Satan and God meet up in Job 1 and verse 8. And uh, God asked Job, I mean, asked Satan uh, who was there. And uh, they were looking at Job. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? And, of course, uh, I'm sure Satan had considered him because he wanted him. He wanted to destroy him. But uh, God says, have you considered him? And he's, he's a, also good, just he's like Noah. He's blameless, upright. He's a good man. And we know the, about the patience of Job. We know about the things he endured for God and how he was devoted to God. And, and statements like, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, Job says. Well, when you see that kind of an attitude, you can see why God saw something of value. And Job, and why he didn't just totally destroy him. His wife said, curse God and die. Get it over with. For heaven's sake, and for your sake, go ahead and curse God. And finalize this. But that's not what happened. Job said, no, I won't. I will not curse God. I will not take the easy path out. And sometimes I know that can be something that uh, we might be interested in. If you're going through terrible diseases and having horrible pain and things of that nature. Uh, my mother-in-law is 95. She's probably watching right now. And at times, life is very difficult for her. But, uh, you know, we need to remember that God loves us and that he cares about us. He values us. And whether he leaves us here or takes us away, he still considers us to be one of his valuable possessions, like we read last week from the scriptures, we're one of his valuable possessions. He treasures us. And again, boy, that bothered me when I prayed. 
and I'm trying to imagine myself as being a possession of God, a treasured possession of God, something that he values. And I wonder what kind of a marvelous God do I have that he can see that much good in me and appreciate me in spite of all that I've done. But those are just some Old Testament illustrations of how Jehovah God uh, saw the faithful as being people of value. But when you come to the New Testament, you find God among us, Emmanuel, Jesus coming to live here on earth, and uh, God incarnate. You see that the same attitude toward humanity continues on. He's still the same loving God, willing to forgive, reaching out to us, trying to pull us in because he values us in spite of our sinful ways. And uh, you see Jesus, when he uh, comes into our world, can look at people and see value in them. John the Baptist came as the forerunner for Jesus. Matthew chapter 11 talks about him a lot. And uh, he find that uh, John was the one, was the herald of the coming of the Son of God. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, he proclaims as Jesus comes down when he's baptizing people to Jordan River. And uh, yet later, when Jesus is still wearing the same outfit he used to wear and still hasn't gotten a white horse and a big sword and he's not, you know, turning out to be the deliverer that the Jewish people expected, uh, John sent some of his disciples over to ask Jesus, are you the one that we've been waiting for? Or should we expect somebody else, maybe? You're not looking much like a conqueror. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, King David, you know, with his slain, took care of Goliath. What, what are you doing? You know, you're going around helping people, healing people, and so forth. But uh, Jesus used that as an answer to the question. And he says, yes, I'm the one. And he says, go and tell John that... Uh, the gospel is being preached to the poor. And as I said, yes, Matthew chapter 11 talks about it. And uh, tell, tell him that the lame are walking, the blind are seen. Tell him that people have been resurrected from the dead. Tell him all of these things that I'm doing and saying and teaching and preaching and how people are being helped. Yes, I am the one that you are waiting on. I am the Messiah. But, you know, Jesus could have taken offense at that, could he not? Are you the one, or do we have to look for somebody else? You know, duh. When are you going to get busy? When are you going to do what you're supposed to do? When are you going to look like God incarnate? When are you going to <coughs> deliver us from this Roman oppression and give us our nation back? And, uh, and so are you the one, or do we look for somebody else? Well, Jesus could have been offended by that. And people listening probably could have thought, that that's the case. Uh, boy, I bet you Jesus is upset with him. But Jesus then asked, he said, why did you go out into the wilderness to see? When you went down with the river Jordan to get baptized by, by John, what were, you, what were you expecting? and What were you looking for? And He said, uh, you know, you're, you're mistaken if you think I'm offended by John. John, by the way, was also a family member, you'll remember but also the one who had been told that if you see a dove come down and rest on one of your baptized candidates, uh, that's going to be the one that is the Messiah. And that happened. And so John had every reason to believe, but he was just concerned about needing to get on with the show and do what they were supposed to be doing. And Jesus didn't seem to be getting it done, and so he questioned him. But Jesus was not offended by John asking the question, and Jesus answered his question and sent those disciples back to John so they could fill him in. But uh, also, we find that uh, Jesus wanted the people that were standing there to know that John was not just somebody. That John, who had questioned whether or not he was the Messiah for a moment, with good reason maybe. And uh, he says, you know, you didn't go out to see a prince dressed in royal garments. You didn't you didn't go out there to see a powerful emperor or something. What you saw 
was just a humble man. And uh, he said, you know, that's the nature that I am portraying because I have my own program, my own plan, and I am the Messiah. But he, and then he said, of all the men that have ever been born, came into this world by the grace of God and the help of mama, uh, all the men that have been born, there has never been one greater than John the Baptist. Now, was that putting John down? What was that doing? Giving him and attributing value to him, not in vain. Not in pretense, but in reality. This is the greatest man that has ever been born of a woman and come into this world. So, how do you think John would feel about that? I said to ask him if he was really the Messiah, and he tells everybody that I'm the greatest man to ever live. Uh, that's not a bad compliment coming from the Son of God, the Creator, the universe. The one, according to John 1, who participated in every aspect of the creation of the whole universe. Uh, you know, and he says, you're the greatest man ever born. That's pretty good. He valued John. And he recognized the value of John. And he wasn't pretending to see value in John. He knew this is a valuable man. This is a wonderful prophet of God. That's what you saw. Would you like to see a prophet? Yes, a prophet. The greatest one that's ever been born. And that's just, you know, marvelous to see that kind of consideration, acknowledgement, and praise. That's how Jesus was, because he was God. And just like God had, could see the value of somebody like Noah or Job, so Jesus could see value in John the Baptist and uh, attributed that value to it. On one occasion, a centurion back in Matthew 8 came and uh, wanted to be blessed by getting some healing, but not for himself, but for a servant that he had that was sick. Suffering, it says, not, you know, you can be sick and not suffer, but this guy was suffering. I don't know what he had or what was going on, but he was suffering. And so the centurion, who is a Roman soldier, and therefore, you don't expect that to be a Jew. That's going to be a Gentile. And uh, he comes to Jesus and he says, I want you to help me if you can. I've got a servant that's sick, and I want you to heal him and uh, give him some relief. Jesus said, well, what do you think I need to do? Do I need to go down to your house? And the centurion said, oh, no, I'm not worthy to have you come into my house. Uh, I wouldn't do that. Ask you, the Messiah, to come into my house and to do something for me. And if it's enough I'm asking a favor, I don't want to have to ask you to make a trip down to my house to take care of this guy. He says, I'm a soldier. I tell the other, I'm a, a centurion. I tell the regular soldiers, uh, come. And they come. I tell them, go. And they go. They obey me. I tell them, do something. They do it. And you know, and I know that that wasn't the case. If they didn't do it, if they didn't respond positively to their commander, they'd be in serious trouble. And he says, uh, I know what authority is. I have authority. I administer authority. And uh, no, I, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. And I'm a Gentile. He could probably have added if he wanted to to try to explain himself. And uh, then Jesus remarked to the crowd that was following him. They also probably wanted a lot of help and consideration and to be valued. And, he, and he, what did he do? He, he said, I have never, ever seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. All the Jewish people I've ever met, I've never seen anyone has that kind of faith. And so what is that centurion going to think as he's standing there hoping that the Messiah will just at least come down or go around or say something or do something to heal his, his servant? And then he hears Jesus attribute to him that kind of faith. This guy's got faith. 
This is the kind of faith every Jew ought to have, but I've never seen it in Israel. Compliments. But what was he doing? In front of a crowd, Jewish people probably, for the most part, he is complimenting this man for his faith, attributing him a special quality. So Jesus, every time he saw people that had problems that were needing his help, but saw that they had virtues that he appreciated, that the scriptures demand. <clears throat> he was willing to acknowledge, yes, there's faith here. There's courage here. There's devotion here. And uh, these people are special people. This is the greatest man ever born of a woman. He, he recognized these qualities. But you know, and I wish I had more time today, but I'm going to keep it down and do it right. Uh, I told you Kelly get in order before she left. But you know, <laughs> as you come to the New Testament, you run into a situation that we might not anticipate. We anticipate maybe Jesus speaking 12 apostles. He did. We imagine him going out and preaching and uh, preaching to people that are powerful politically and uh, rich, economically speaking. And uh, but. Uh, you see that uh, he also recognized this virtue and the value of people everywhere he looked. Well, so did the Apostle Paul, as we mentioned with Epaphroditus and with Timothy. But one of the characters that just kind of pops out of the blue is a guy that got baptized right in the beginning of what Juan was reading about, you know, the establishment of the church, Acts chapter 2. Well, then you find immediately these people have come to Jerusalem for a feast day. They're not planning on staying there. Uh, some of our members are out on the road right now and uh, kind of holiday type situation. And so, you know, we know they're gone, but we expect them to come back. They have a life here. They have jobs here. They, they have their house here. And so they'll be back. And uh, so sometimes we don't uh, see an immediate response like we expect. But and, and sometimes we don't anticipate problems that are going to arise like all of a sudden, we've got out 3,000 people and they don't have enough money to stay two or three weeks. They just came here for the holiday and they were going to go home, a religious celebration, and they're going to go home. And now they're, they want to stay. Everybody wants to stay. We just got baptized. We just found out about the church. We just came to understand about the kingdom of God. And now we're in it. And we want to stay and learn more. We want to do more. This is incredible. 3,000 people baptized the first day. And then you go over to Acts chapter 4 and verse 4, and you got, you know, 5,000 men, not even counting the women. This thing is exploding. Oh, this is wonderful. I think I'll just go home. No, I want to stay. Well, how are you going to stay? You don't have enough money to stay. Well, that's where the apostles ask the people could to donate money so that those who were going broke, staying there, would be able to stay a little longer, learn a little more and get more prepared to go out and preach the gospel somewhere else. And so a guy named Barnabas comes out of the crowd and says, well, I've got some land I can sell. I live right here in Jerusalem, uh, and I could sell that land and give you the money. And so he brings and puts the money at the feet of the apostles. And apparently it was a considerable amount of money, and he was a nice contribution. And uh, the apostles eventually give him a name that, was not the one given to him by his mom or dad. He was called the son of encouragement. Well, how did he encourage? Well, on the first day, he encouraged by giving money. He put some money there to help everybody stay in town and to help promote the kingdom. But then he continued on as a faithful member of the church in the city of Jerusalem. He was there when this monster of a guy called Saul of Tarsus, he was in the city of Tarsus, began to persecute the church. Oh, was he ever a serious problem? I mean, everything was going great. 3,000 people got baptized, 5,000 men now, not counting the women and the young people that were baptized. And everything's going great, but then here comes Saul, uh, this zealous Jewish lad who thinks we're a heresy. And he's trying to stop everything we're trying to do by persecuting the church. So what do we do? 
We hide from Saul. We try and continue with what we're doing in spite of him. But then he realizes that this crazy movement called Christianity as we know it today is spreading. It's going to other places and getting out of Jerusalem. Some of the people that got persecuted left and went to other places preaching. Well, when that happens, he hears that up in Damascus, they've got a group. Well, that's no problem. I can go up to Damascus. I've been there before. I'll just get on my animal and take off and we'll ride up there and we'll see what we can do about those people. But on the way, you know the story. Jesus appears to him. And one of the reasons is because Acts 23 verse 1 says that he lived according to good conscience all the days of his life. So he thinks he's doing a good thing by persecuting Christians. And so he thinks he's doing a good thing beyond what he'd done in Jerusalem by going to Damascus. But on the way, Jesus appears to him and a light blinds him and he actually is blinded for a while. And uh, he asked, who are you, Lord? And Jesus responded and said, I am Jesus who you persecute. Boy, his heart must have dropped down into his belly at that point. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm persecuting God's people. I'm persecuting the believers in Jesus, and he's the Messiah. You know, what would you have me do, Lord? And he sent him to Damascus, and then Ananias, who was afraid to go and baptize him because he had heard of his reputation, Nevertheless, was told by God, he, no, he's a chosen instrument for me. I talked about that last week. A chosen instrument. Go get him. We need him. We need to recruit Saul of Tarsus. Oh, my goodness. And so Ananias goes, baptizes him, and then Paul goes back into Jerusalem. And you can imagine when uh, he shows up how the Christians would scatter. They were scared to death of him. And he said, no, wait, wait, uh, I'm one of you now. And everybody's saying, yeah, right. That's a good trick. I'm not stupid. I'm not coming down there and let you grab me. And so nobody believed him. And then this guy named Barnabas, the one that gave the land, the one who was trying to help everybody, the one that was cooperative, that was called by the apostles the son of encouragement. He steps in. He talks to uh, Saul of Tarsus, and that had to take some, as we say, guts to do that, and uh, finds out what happened to him on the road to Damascus. I got converted. I saw the Lord, and then when he's convinced to go, he takes him, takes Saul of Tarsus to be with the apostles. I mean, that's nice, you know. We've got the number one enemy of the faith being taken into the presence of the twelve most important men. That we've got in the kingdom. Uh, what, are you, what are you doing, Barnabas? I want you to listen to what he has to say and what I have to say. And he told how he got converted. And uh, I mean, you know, Barnabas actually told the story to the apostles and they listened and they believed him. And then he was accepted, son of encouragement. What happened? Barnabas saw what was good about. And that's what he changed his name to because Saul's name he didn't want to bear any longer. It was given to him by his parents, but he didn't want to be known as Saul anymore because he'd been persecuting the Christians so badly they didn't need to go out and say, hey, I'm Saul. Uh, everybody scatters. He, I, I, no, I'm Paul the Apostle. And uh, so he changed his name. And Barnabas backed in that. Well, then they began to work together. I mean, Barnabas already was working in the church in Jerusalem in a strong way. But he was also going out to Antioch, where a church was established and began to grow. But then it was growing so fast, he could, and uh, he didn't actually start it, but some people that came from the same island of Cyprus that he'd come from were over there doing a great job. And so they're saying, Barnabas, you got to come over and help us. You're, you know, you're our countryman, as well as our brother in Christ. you got to help us. And so he's trying to help, and he realizes, ooh, this is too big. But he remembered that guy that uh, had persecuted the church was a scholar, <coughs> that he was a student of Gamaliel. So he, he runs over to Tarsus, where Paul's gone. Now he's not Saul of Tarsus. Now he's Paul of Tarsus. And he gets Paul and brings him back. I've got to have your help. You've got to come and work with us. You'd be wonderful for this ministry that we're starting in Antioch. So then 
here he comes. And he and Barnabas do an incredible job. Now, as you go along, and there's other things I would like to mention, but it's not time. But Barnabas helped Saul, now Paul, to go into a conference that was held later in Acts 15, where some of the leaders of the church didn't want to accept uh, some of the circumstances, customs, background, and so forth of some of the uh, Gentiles who had become Christians. And there was a big, it was a fuss that could have led to racial division in the church right away. And it could cause cultural differences, religious differences. And so, who goes to help? Well, Barnabas. And uh, he went on the first missionary journey with Paul in Acts chapter 13. Uh, the Holy Spirit said, separate out from me, Saul of Tarsus, now Paul, and uh, Barnabas. And I want them to go on a mission trip. And they went on a mission trip and had a lot of success. Uh, John Mark, uh, the nephew of Barnabas, went with them. He recruited somebody. But uh, he turned back. He didn't continue to the end of the trip. And that caused problems later. And Paul says, uh, I'm going on a second trip. Third trip is going to come up too. But uh, I want to take uh, uh uh, this person, that person, but uh, and Barnabas says, and, and John Mark, we need to give John Mark another chance. Now, doesn't that sound like something that the son of encouragement would do? That's what he did. And he says, I want to give John Mark another chance. And, you know, we esteem and value the Apostle Paul. Half of the New Testament was written by him. And yet, uh, he didn't want to take this man. But who did? the son of encouragement, Barnabas. He saw value. He saw potential in Saul and carried him before the apostles to get him approved. He saw potential also now in John Mark. And he said, this guy's got a lot of possibilities. And uh, excuse me, brother Paul, oh, but I think we need to take him. And no, I'm not going to let that man go with me. And they actually went two different ways. They broke up, and uh, Barnabas took John Mark and went on a sea trip over to Cyprus, where he was born and reared, and uh, where they had started their first missionary journey, whereas Paul went the land route and went around the backside of the Mediterranean, and uh, all of that turned out to be a success. The work of Paul turned out to be a greater success and maybe Barnabas made a strategic mistake in deciding to go back to Cyprus instead of going where Paul wanted to go over into Asia Minor. But nevertheless, they departed and went different ways, each with the one they wanted to take. Paul was Silas and Barnabas with his nephew, John Mark. And that's the end of the story, except for what tradition has, and that is that in Cyprus, uh, Barnabas lost his life. But as you see all these things, you think about the verses we've read, and then think about, you know, the idea of valuing each other against <laughs> two, three, and then appreciating the potential of each other, realizing the need to help each other, love each other, forgive each other, be a family. And then you can really, really understand the spirit that pervaded the members of the church in the first century, at least in the very outset, and the good work they did because they were united. And that's what I want to leave with you today. And uh, we're valuing you. And uh, we're valuing those of you that are going to stay with us for the rest of your life, and those of you that might be leaving, going somewhere else. Uh, we all have an intrinsic value that God wants to take advantage of. But we've got to be available to him and we've got to see the value in other people. Can you imagine how many how many people have not preached the gospel cold in? I invited him to push him to do it and he did a good job. 
and I'm looking forward to him doing more in the future. And I think about my own grandchildren and what they're doing. And uh, my students for Tuesday afternoons. And uh, you'd say, Bob, why don't you spend more time with some of the old guys? So they're old. <laughs> And there's a lot of years in these boys and uh, a great future, but we've got to value each other. No, I, I, can't, I can't let this person do what they have. Masha, you get ready to help us out, right? With the, oh, yeah. yeah, she and David have agreed to take over Doug's position and handling the books, which is not very hard when you don't have much money coming in. <laughs> So we're not worried about that, but uh, you know, volunteers that step up, people that want to go to Eagle Academy and help out over there, you know, and say, but but she's a woman, and she's a woman. Well, if you want somebody to cook food and take it over to the kids over there at Eagle Academy, I guarantee you, uh, maybe Jim could do some good cooking for them. But uh, most of us would just make their lives miserable if we assume the responsibility of cooking food for the kids at Eagle Academy. But uh, we're grateful if you're a male or if you're like Phoebe who carried the Roman letter in her hands and delivered it to the church in the biggest city of the world in the first century. And if you're, you know, there to serve and doing what God permits you to do, not saying you should be an elder of the church, a deacon or a preacher, uh, can't have my job, I have to turn over some guy. But, uh, you know, still there are lots that can be done. A lot that can be done in the kingdom. And we need to value our women. We need to value our youth. We need to value the wisdom of the older guys who've lived life and maybe made mistakes and know how to give good counsel to those that are following in their footsteps. But we need to do, like we're told in Romans 12, verse 10, devote ourselves one to another, devote ourselves. Philippians two, three. We need to value the other person, and then we need to build each other up, like we're told in First Corinthians chapter fourteen, over and over again. We need to build up the faith, the knowledge, the capacity of all those in the kingdom. And I pray that uh, that's our goal, and we want to do that. And then when people make a trip like Epaphroditus did. He comes back and he walks into town and we're shocked to see him alive. We give thanks to God for Epaphroditus. When Paul tells us what Timothy did for him, he was like a son to me, took good care of me. And he was like a secretary to me. Well, we need to give thanks to God for Timothy. And we need to give thanks when you pray. Remember the members of the church, not just those that are seriously ill or getting ready to be operated on men. But, you know, those in good health and enjoying life, pray for them. Pray for them. And uh, because why? Because you value them. And you know that God values them. And Cole is going to be a preacher. When I study with him every week, he's real active in that. So that's what I want to leave with you today, okay? God bless you. Bill, you want to come and fill us in on some announcements? You know, you're going to have to buy a clock and put it on a wall up there. I don't know what time it is. <laughs> and don't tell me later how many minutes I've preached. <laughs>